Hi guys, it is turning out to be a gorgeous day here in the rapidly escalating collapse of global industrial civilization. Maybe this breeze will uh, take some of the sting off the 90 degree afternoon heat in March today. Uh, and I'm, I apologize if the uh, wind noise gets in, way, in the way of <clears throat> this chronicle uh, such as the risk of living in the collapse of global industrial civilization. So anyway, my name is Sam Mitchell and this is my little co-pilot Sancho Panza here on I believe it's somewhere like Thursday, March 26, uh, 2020, somewhere around there. So guys, uh, I, I'm just have to mention we have a new format here and that is I'm going to be doing for the foreseeable future since I have nothing else to do with my life here in isolation in Garfield, Texas I'm going to be doing two videos. I'm going to be doing a collapse chronicle such as the one I'm getting ready to do that is not about coronavirus although even this one has coronavirus mentioned in it and then I'm going to be doing a second video each day a coronavirus chronicle so for the next few weeks uh, lucky you get to get two videos and so anyway this one is going to be today's collapse chronicle talking about birds and bird song uh, it's actually fairly quiet right now in Garfield, Texas. I don't know if it's my imagination, guys, but I have heard more bird song this year in Garfield, Texas. It seems to me that there are more songbirds out uh, the past month uh, than there have been in years. I've been back here in, in three weeks, never seen anything alike. How many birds I there was a mockingbird out singing away at midnight last night never heard a mockingbird in Garfield Texas I had a bluebird flying through here the hummingbirds are up at the feeder the Cardinals are nesting in the uh, pomegranate tree I don't know where these little wrens are nesting but uh, what you're hearing out there now are the good old grackles I don't know why grackles are so maligned. I actually kind of like grackles. But anyway, as long as we're all talking about birds, I want to thank uh, my lieutenant, Daniel Geary, for sending me uh, today's essay by a man who I have read essays before. Uh, I need to get him on the show. Uh, and this is Tom Englehart. Tom is the head cook and bottle washer of uh, that excellent website Tom's Dispatch and this was reprinted in Common Dreams so uh, take it away Tom Englehart with your ode to well disappearing songbirds in memoriam a planet of missing beauties the skies are emptying out I guess they're just moving to Garfield okay take it away Tom <clears throat> the other morning walking at the edge of a local park I caught sight of a beautiful red cardinal the first bird I ever saw some 63 years ago actually to make that sentence accurate I should probably have put either first or ever saw in quotation marks after all I was already 12 years old and even as a city boy I had seen plenty of birds if nothing else New York where I grew up is a city of pigeons birds which know nothing about social distancing nonetheless in a different sense at age 12 I saw parentheses, was struck by, stunned by, awed by, 
that bright red bird, I was visiting a friend in Connecticut, and miraculously enough, though it was 1956, his parents had a bird identification book of some kind in their house. When I leafed through it, I came across the very bird I had seen, read about it, and on going home, wrote a tiny essay about the experience for my <clears throat> sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Casey. Six de decades later, in this grim coronavirus march of 2020, with my city essentially in lockdown and myself in something like self-isolation, <clears throat> I have to admit that I feel a little embarrassed writing about that bird. In fact, I feel as if I should apologize for doing so. After all, who can doubt that we are now in a COVID-19 world from hell in a country being run into the ground by the president from hell on the planet that he and his cronies are remarkably intent on burning to hell. Uh, anyway, guys, I said this was not going to be a coronavirus chronicle, but this, uh, you know, you cannot get a, a, an essay published uh, anymore if you do not mention the word coronavirus. If you, if you do not mention the coronavirus, it doesn't matter what subject you are talking about. You really have to reach far uh, you know, to get a coronavirus angle. But let's get back to the birds. Get away from coronavirus. You can go hear about that on the Coronavirus Chronicles. So get back to the birds, uh, Tom. Okay, so a cardinal? Really? That's what I want to focus on in a world which, as it grows hotter by the year, will only be more susceptible to more pandemics, not to speak of staggering fires, flooding, extreme storms, and God knows what else. Honestly, given a country of closed schools, self-isolating adults, and the sick and dying on a planet that seems to be cracking open in a country which until recently could not test as many people for coronavirus. Okay, uh, blah, blah, blah. Where is my sense of proportion? I I'm beginning to figure out what, uh, what Tom is getting at here uh, about how the coronavirus, I guess I should have vetted my own collapse chronicle. Uh, I'm going to have to do a lot better job starting tomorrow. Uh, I, I see the subterfuge. Okay, if Tom Englehart mentions the C word one more time in this article, I, I'm, I'm just going to cut it off and say, uh, Tom, until you are ready, to, to talk about the damn birds and not about the C word. We don't want to hear it over here. We're gonna give we're gonna give Tom Engelhart one more chance. <clears throat> Still, if you can, bear with me for a moment. I think there's a connection if even if anything but ob obvious between our troubled world and that flaming bird I saw so long ago. Let me start this way. Believe it or not, birds were undoubtedly the greatest secret of my teenage years. On spring weekends, my best friend and I would regularly head for Central Park, that magnificent patch of green at the center of Manhattan Island. That was the moment when the spectacular annual migration would be at its height and the park, one of the few obvious places in a vast urban landscape, left for birds to alight. Sharing his uncle's clunky old binoculars, my friend and I would wander there 
when Wander alone there, having told no one, including our families, what we were doing. We were on the lookout for exotic birds of every sort on their journeys north. Of course, for us then, they were almost all exotic. There, this is in 1956, in 1956, there were brilliant scarlet tanagers with glossy black wings, chestnut and black orchard orioles, birds I would not see again for decades, as well as the more common, even more vivid Baltimore orioles. And of course, there were all the warblers, those tiny flitting singing creatures of just about every color and design. American red starts, black burnians, black and whites, black throated blues, blue wings, chestnut sided, common yellow throats, magnolias, prairies, palms, and yellows. And there was, and here was the secret key to our secret pastime the old burgers. Mind you, when I say old, I mean perhaps my age now or even significantly younger, that they would be sitting on benches by Belvedere Castle overlooking Belvedere Lake, in reality a pond, watching those very birds. They were remarkably patient, not to say amused or amazed by the two teenage boys so eager to watch with them and learn from them. They were generous with their binoculars, quick to identify birds we otherwise would never have known or perhaps even noticed. And for me at least, those birds were indeed a wonder. They were genuine beauties of this planet and in some odd way my friend and I grasp, grasped that deeply. In fact, ever since we've grown up, though this year may prove to be a self-isolating exception, we have always tried to meet again in that park as May began for one more look, for one more look at, one more moment immersed in, the deep and moving winged beauty of this planet of ours. Of course, in the 1950s, all of this was our deepest secret for the most obvious of reasons, at least then. If you were a boy and admitted that you actually wanted to look at birds, I'm not sure the phrase bird watch was even in use at the time, God knows what your peers would have said about you. They would, we had no doubt of this, have simply drummed us out of the core of boys. That any of them might then have had their own set of secret fascinations would never of course have crossed our minds. All you have to do to conjure up the mood of that moment you know, 1956, is to imagine our president back then and the kind of mockery to which he would certainly have subjected boys who looked at birds. Now, so many decades later, in another America, uh, in which a great recession come depression could be on the horizon and our future FDR, that is the president who helped us out of the last Great Depression in the 1950s, could be an over the hill 77 year old vice president. It seems odd indeed to write about beautiful birds from another earthly moment but maybe that is the point. Think about it this way. As last year ended, Science Magazine reported that in North America alone, there were three billion 
fewer birds than in 1970. In other words, almost one out of three birds on this continent is now gone, and I'm sure there is a big drop between 1956 and 1970. As Carl Zimmer of the New York Times put it, the skies are emptying out. Among them, warblers, you know, uh, that whole list that he talked about that you could actually still see in Central Park in 1956. Among them, warblers have taken one of the heaviest hits. There are an estimated 617 million fewer warblers than in 1970. As, as well as birds more generally that migrate up the East Coast and so have a shot at still landing in Central Park. Many are the causes including habitat loss, pesticides, and even feral cats, not to mention domestic cats. I don't know why he picked on feral cats, but climate change is undoubtedly a factor as well and of course with each passing year will become a bigger factor. The authors of the Audubon Society's most recent national report for instance suggest that quote, if Earth continues to warm according to current trends rising three degrees Celsius by 2100 this is based at a three degree, which is probably a joke. Uh, more than two thirds of North American bird species will be vulnerable to extinction due to range loss. Extinction, take that word in, they will be gone. No more fini. That, by the way, is a global, not just a North American reality and such an apocalyptic, and such apocalyptic possibilities are hardly restricted to birds. Insects, for instance, are experiencing their own Armageddon and while monarch butterflies down 90% in the U.S. aside, we humans don't tend to think of insects as beauties. They are, among other things, key pollinators and crucial for food chains everywhere. As I've been noticing each night here on the porch, virtually zero insects showing up around my porch light here in Central Texas. Or think about it this way. <clears throat> On Monday, March 8th, in my hometown, New York City, it was 68 degrees, and that was nothing. I think it was around that date, it was also 68 degrees in Antarctica, if I remember correctly, uh, Tom. After all, on February 19th in Central Park, the temperature hit a record-breaking 78 degrees Fahrenheit in the heart of winter. Not just the highest for that day on record, but for the month of February, historically speaking. At the time, we were passing through a winter in which essentially no snow had fallen, and that should have surprised no one. After all, January had started the year with a bang globally as the hottest January on record, which again should have surprised no one since the last five years have been the warmest ever recorded on this planet. Ditto the last 10 years and 19 of the last 20 years. Oh, and 2020 already has a 50% chance of being the warmest year ever. 
And by the way, soon after that 68 degree day in our parks, I began to notice the first crocuses and daffodils pushing through the soil and blooming. It was little short of remarkable, and in truth, would have been beautiful, not to say glorious. The weather, the flowers, the, e the sense of ease and comfort, the springiness of everything, you know, in February. If you didn't know that just what such beauty actually meant on a planet potentially heating to pandemic proportions. How sad when what is still truly beautiful on this globe of ours increasingly tells a story that could not be grimmer. Yeah, come back in a few years, uh, Tom. Yeah, anyone who thinks that this story could not get grimmer. So, Think of this as my in-memoriam essay about the planet. I thought I grew up on and so I think so think of this as my in-memoriam essay about the planet I thought I grew up on and the birds I thought I knew. Consider it a kind of epitaph in advance for a world that, if the rest of us cannot get ourselves together, if we cannot rid ourselves of arsonists like Donald Trump and his crew of those fossil-fueled CEOs that he loves so much, many may, meaning the planet, all too soon seem unrecognizable. In the meantime, Consider me semi-locked in in my apartment to be in my own fashion in mourning. Not for myself, mind you, though I am almost 76 and my years on this planet are bound to be limited, but for those I will be leaving behind, my children and grandchildren in particular, this just was not the world I ever wanted them to inherit. In truth, in this moment of ours, our world is being transformed before our eyes into one of missing beauties. Given my teenage years, I want to have my grandchildren, I want to leave my grandchildren the pleasure of entering Central Park in some distant May long after I am gone and still seeing the brilliant colors of a scarlet tanager. That is my hope despite everything. Yes, I'm sure Tom Englehart uh, really believes for one second that his grandchildren are going to be able to see a scarlet tanager in Central Park in a distant May. Uh, he better be uh, damn glad if his grandchildren uh, see a plate of food in front of their damn faces. Uh, anyway, guys, I apologize for uh, breathing the C word in that chronicle of the collapse. I will try to do better if I can find an article about the collapse of a planet that does not mention the C word. But anyway, if you did enjoy what Tom had to say about our collapsing planet, please spend a few seconds to thumb up this video, and please subscribe when you're over here, and we're going to let Mr. Wren take us out.
says, Mr. Wren, why can't I tell the difference between a cardinal and a wren? The, who are you? The cardinals are building a nest in the... No, that's the wren in the pomegranate tree. The pomegranates are blooming. This is my pomegranate tree bursting into bloom. Aren't those gorgeous? I guess I made Mr. Rand nervous. Uh, get out there and enjoy your bird song and organic pomegranates while you still can. Bye, guys.